Hi, everybody. It's December 30th, 2014, and podcast time. This is Chuck, and we're talking about how sea monsters work. This is a great episode from back in the day. I remember, boy, this is hard to believe, almost six years ago. Time is really flying, everybody. I'm getting old. Uh, This is a fun podcast episode, though. How sea monsters work, right here, right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's guest producer Noel. There's Nikola Tesla. It's Stuff You Should Know. There's Johnny and Scott. Are those your imaginary friends? No, that was uh, Sigmund, the sea monster. Did you watch that show? No. Oh, once again, the, the brief cultural divide that spans between us. Was that from the <laughs> 70s or early 80s? Yeah, it was one of the Sid and Marty Croft shows. Oh, H.R. Puff and stuff. Huh? Yeah, Sigmund the Sea Monster and Johnny and Scott were his buddies. Yeah. And he was like a, uh, you know, he was a, a dude in a suit, I reckon, but he was he looked like a big blob of kelp. I'm sure it was total nightmare fuel. <laughs> With eyes. That was cool. Sid and Marty Croft, man. Oh, yeah. Their sensibilities <laughs> scare me. Yeah, I went to the place once in Atlanta, you know, they had down at the Omni... Uh, which is now Phillips mm-hmm. Arena. Mm-hmm. They had Sid Mardi Croft World or whatever, and I went down there once, and looking back now, it was like a drug-fueled sure. uh, indoor amusement park. You're like, why are there so many 20-year-olds <laughs> here? Yeah, was, I never really put Without this... Without kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure I say this every single time that we talk about Sid Mardi Croft, but you've seen the Mr. Show State of drug one. Yeah. Day. God, I love that. That's one of the best... I mean, it's hard to pick out for Mr. Show, but... That's definitely up there. Yeah, that's top five. Easy. Yeah. And that's Sea Monsters. Sea <laughs> Monsters. They're going to get you soon. Is that from a show? No. <laughs> okay. It's from this show. So, Chuck, are you familiar much with Sea Monsters when you were researching this? Were you like, everybody knows all this? Sort of half and half. Yeah. I felt similar... There were a lot of stuff, a lot of things in here that I hadn't heard of, and the extra research we did, too, yielded sure. some new insights. But one of the things that stuck out to me, and I guess it's probably the thesis of this whole thing, is that we've been seeing sea monsters for millennia. We've been talking about sea monsters for millennia. Oh, yeah. And we still are. Like, have you heard of the Montauk monster? Yes. Did you see pictures of that thing? Yeah, I remember when it came out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I just heard of it. This, oh, really? Like yesterday, yeah. Oh, I feel bad for not sharing that with you. It's awesome. Yeah, the, in uh, 2008, um, what was the beach? It was around Montauk. Yeah, but there was a specific beach, uh, Ditch Plains Beach. Uh, this uh, girl and her three friends found this uh, washed up Montauk monster. And I think what's funny is they still... There's a trend here in naming these things right. sensationally throughout history. Yeah. And we still do it because well, they could yeah. have called it like a decomposed raccoon, but they called it the Montauk monster. Right. <laughs> and the jury is not out. It is a decomposed raccoon. Yeah. they. But, I mean, they pretty much think so, but yeah. it's not like you can't prove that. But I mean, they have like a, a line of biologists from Montauk to Manhattan yeah. saying it's a raccoon. It's a raccoon without its fur. Yeah. Which makes it look awesome. I've heard some other paleo mm. uh, zoologists say, like, it may be a sheep, though. Um, I think it was too small. Or other animals. Gotcha. But it's definitely not a monster, a sea monster. No, but this is 2008 we're talking about, and some weird thing washes up on a beach, and around the world, people hear of the Montauk monster, except for me. Yeah, did you see the East River monster? Uh, I heard that one was a pig. Yeah, it's clearly a pig, but it's still kind of cool looking, but still... They named it the East River Monster right. and not a pig that was, you know, I don't know how the pig got there. Right. The the pig of East River or something like that. Yeah. It's probably like, you know, somewhere in Chinatown, a pig was no good and they said, go throw that thing in the river. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, also in 2006, um, there was one in Russia. I didn't see where, but on a beach, uh, something washed up and they said, sea monster. Yeah. And it turned out to be a beluga whale carcass, greatly decomposed. But it looked weird. It didn't look anything like a beluga whale. But the point is, is still, in the 21st century, whenever the sea spits something up, yeah, we're like, this is a monster. Clearly, obviously, this is a monster. And then biologists come along and say, it's not a monster, but it's this weird thing. Or sometimes they say, this is new. 
Yeah. It's not a monster, but this is new. And th- this is the point, finally, that I'm trying to get to, is that the the oceans, the seas, cover 70% of Earth's surface. Yeah. Right? That's a lot of hiding places. Sure. And I think humans have known and still know intuitively that there is a lot of stuff down there that we don't know about. We don't know what it is. But over time, we've science has replaced superstition enough so that while we still know there's stuff out there that we don't know, we don't think of them as monsters. So our mindset has changed somewhat. Yeah. But ultimately, the sea is this place of unknown unknown organisms yeah. that we're still learning about. Sure. The, what's the 90 to 95% of the, the deepest seas are still un, completely like unresearched and undiscovered? Well, James Cameron just took away a, a little percentage of that with his deep sea dive. He took away a bit of my soul with every movie he's made since Terminator 2. <laughs> oh, really? You like Terminator 2? I didn't see that one. Yeah, it was pretty good. Huh. Yeah, I think that was that was a good one. Have you not seen Titanic? <laughs> Did you know that the there was an alternate ending for it where like they kept the diamond or oh or I no you meant where something like the Titanic didn't sink. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out well in the end. No, Bill Paxton ended up Getting in on throwing the diamond away, that's what it was, yeah. I think. Um, speaking of recent uh, sea monsters, though, which is not a sea monster, but did you see the footage of the anglerfish recently? That, that's another great point. Yeah. Some of these deep sea creatures look like creepy monsters. Right. I mean, the, the anglerfish is one of the scariest looking things I've ever seen in my life. Creepy. And uh, it's real, though. It's just, you know, science is It's not like, oh, what is this thing? They know what the anglerfish is. Exactly. But they live so deep. Uh, I think until recently it had never been filmed in its habitat. Until like this year, 2014. Yeah, until like three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently it wasn't until 1975 that we ever photographed a whale underwater. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. 2006, I think, um, or 1976, we discovered the Megamouth shark. Yeah. Uh, the, there's, the, the sea just coughs up new life sure. to us that, yeah, were we slightly more superstitious, we would have called monsters. So that's pretty much the explanation of sea monsters. But it goes back, like, really, really far, and looking at the different kind of monsters we came up with really kind of reveals a lot about our mentality. Yeah, it goes back, I mean, pretty much since people were writing stuff down, somebody was writing about some kind of sea monster, like the ocean has always just enthralled folks, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Mesopotamians had the goddess uh, Tiamat, uh, it was a sea monster. Well, she yeah, and she was their creator goddess originally. Yeah. So if you go far enough back in Mesopotamian lore, that's where the world came from. That's where the universe came from was Tiamat, right? No. Yeah. And then eventually, as Mesopotamia grew and evolved, um, she became what's known as a chaos monster. Yeah. And she was s- slain by a male hero as... And then the world was created from from that. But originally, she was just a, a benevolent creator goddess. Well, and we'll see as we go through here, not all of the sea monsters, it depends on the culture and the religion, uh, some of them were benevolent. I know the Chinese revere their dragons yeah. and sea monsters. Yeah. Uh, the Old Testament had its Leviathan. So, it's even in the Bible. Right. And this is a question of mine, dude. Is do, do, Don't you think that the Leviathan and Tiamat are one and the same, and in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew God slaying the old Mesopotamian gods, saying, don't even bring that here. Like, you created the world, I slay you. Yeah. I am God. Well, I mean, there's a lot of crossover with stuff from the the Old Testament and other religions, and uh, some people take great offense to that, others don't. That that it's not, no, this is the word of God. Oh, sure. Period. Right. It, there is no crossover. That's just coincidence. Right. Yeah. Um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I think Jules Verne, this quote is pretty cool. Uh, in 1870, he wrote that great, great book. Uh, and he said, either we do know all the right varieties of beings which people our planet, or we do not. Uh, if we do not know them all, if nature has still secrets in the deeps for us. Nothing is more conformable to reason than to admit the existence of fishes or cetaceans and other kinds of even new species. To which the character receiving that monologue said, duh. <laughs> yeah, but it just it kind of plays to the point um, that 
if there are undiscovered things, they're always high in the mountains or deep in the jungles or deep under the sea because people would have seen them. So it makes it exotic and uh, sort of grabby as a means of religion or literature, you know, right. lore. Right. Plus, the, Jules Verne was writing in, well, this is 1870 when he wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So this is a, a time when a lot of the old myths and legends and monsters were being um, subsumed by biology. So yeah. like, yeah, that monster that you saw, that thing does exist, but it's not actually a kraken. It's, it's an oarfish. It's it's yeah, or it's a uh, it's a giant squid. Yeah. And and here's, you know, what it does and how it reproduces and because it's being studied, it's not just being feared. Yeah. It's a good point. Uh the Greeks and Romans, if you're a fan of mythology, they are there are tons and tons of cool stories about sea creatures and sea monsters, all kinds of monsters. Uh, namely one, uh, Cetus, named by the Romans, mm -hmm. uh, King uh, Cepheus, uh, had a wife named Cassiopeia. And they ruled Ethiopia, apparently. And she said, you know what, my daughter Andromeda is more beautiful than all the sea nymphs. And of course... Um, She's like, yeah, I said it. Yeah, and Cetus was like, all right, well, I've got a dog-like head, and I'm part fish, and I'm going to come up and kill your daughter. Yeah, Poseidon and, went, uh, kill, kill Cetus. Yeah. And Perseus, of course, is always saving the day. So he apparently was flying back, carrying Medusa's head that he'd just chopped off. Oh, yeah. Flying around and uh, just happened to pass by, uh, was it Persephone, who was about to be eaten? Andromeda. Andromeda. And said, all right, I'll take care of Cetus on my way home. My sword's bloody already? Yeah. Harry Hamlin. Yeah. Isn't that who it was? <laughs> yeah. I never saw the remake of that. Did you see that? No. I didn't either. I just remember, release the Kraken. <laughs> yeah. Was a buzzword. Yeah, that's right. Liam Neeson has a knack for buzzy movie uh, lines of dialogue. Because mm -hmm. that uh, very particular set of skills was also yeah. a big thing for six months. That he said in like months. four different movies. No, it was just in the one. Are you sure? Yeah, Taken. Yeah. That was a pretty good movie, by the way. Sure. Sure. Did not see the sequel, though. Taken 2, Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, I thought it was weird when he started breaking. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the worm. Yeah. But, like, not even very well. I would have thought they'd get, like, a body double who was, like, a professional dancer. Well, to do he, it, he did not have a particular set of skills when it came to being on the cardboard. <laughs> no. So, Chuck, you were talking about Perseus slaying Cetus. Yeah. Um, Homer's Odyssey was also another great uh, book of legends and mythology. Yeah. And there were some sea monsters in it. Yeah. Uh, Scylla or Scylla and uh, Charybdis. <laughs> Charybdis. Uh, these two point out an important and ongoing... Um, feature of some of these stories, which are that maybe they might symbolize something else real. Yes. Either a sea monster, or in this case, maybe a dangerous reef or whirlpools. That's a pretty common thing. I know the Kraken, uh, also the most dangerous part about the Kraken, supposedly, is the whirlpool that it creates. Right. So um, this is kind of a, this is one thesis on why sea monsters developed. Yeah. It was as an allegory. Yeah, a, 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 you know, a tale told of, of warning. Right, so that quote or that description of Scylla is described as having 12 feet, six heads atop long sinuous necks, and mouths bristling with rows of shark-like teeth. Well, um, that's probably a reef, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And then Charybdis lay on the opposite shore and periodically swallowed and regurgitated the waters there. Probably a whirlpool, right? Yeah, so it's but, a story saying maybe don't go there exactly, in your boat. Exactly. Did you read that thing on nuclear semiotics? I, uh, I did not. Dude, let me tell you about this for a second, okay? There is this, um, this whole exploration that's trying to figure out how to express... Say, so, like, if you have nuclear waste and you need to put it away for 10,000 years yeah. and to keep people away from it for 10,000 years, 
you have to figure out a way to warn people away from it sure. for 10,000 years. Well, how could you possibly do that? Put up a Godzilla sign. That's one idea. Sure. There's a lot of other ideas, and this whole thing is called nuclear semiotics. And one of the ways to – probably the most agreed-upon way is to create this thing called the nuclear priesthood. Yeah. Which is this group of learned people who know the secret of this nuclear waste site. Yeah. But purposefully come up with a folklore to warn people away. So to add some sort of like superstitious danger or something sure. to the site that will get passed down and passed down. So eventually the people surrounding that area who live around it will know like you don't want to go there. You'll get killed. It has nothing to do with nuclear radiation yeah. anymore. But this folklore will get passed along and along. And they're saying like that may be the best way to pass along information. And that's exactly what – um what the idea, one interpretation of what sea monsters are is. Yeah, it's like a ghost story, too. You know, you don't want your kids to go in that decrepit house with all the rusty nails. Right. Tell them a scary old lady lives in there. Or to play near the water. You yeah. don't want the You don't want a uh, carpy to take you away. It's really just manipulating uh, your dumb kid. Pretty much. <laughs> into not doing dangerous things. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it works, and it's a w- and over time, it's gotten passed down. So that's one interpretation of sea monsters. There's also, like you said, the kraken, um, possibly being the giant squid, or I shouldn't even say possibly. It's probably a giant squid, right? Yeah, there's always been stories of the kraken uh, terrorizing ships off of Iceland and Norway, and uh, the kraken is noted because it is huge, like 1.5 uh, a mile to a mile and a half wide, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. The Kraken is, like you said, most likely a giant squid. If you see a, if you're a sailor back then mm-hmm. and you don't know about biology and things yet, and you see a, uh, so, uh, an eyeball pop out the size of a human head, right? It might make you think that's a big Kraken sea monster. Exactly. So then, if that gets embellished into something that's a mile and a half wide with legs as as large as a um, sailing mast, capable of pulling down a ship. Well, I mean, it gets the point across to people back on land. Like, wow, that was a really big monster that you guys saw. How big do these squids get? They get to like 40, 43 feet, 40, 40 feet long. There's something even bigger called the colossal squid. Yeah. That's so much bigger. It's its own um, species, I believe. Um, and it lives just in the Antarctic. So it was probably not the basis of the Kraken. Right. It's probably just a regular old giant squid. But you've seen giant squids. Look look at those things. Right, exactly. They're scary looking. They are very scary, and they're very, very big. Plus also the idea of the Kraken may have first come about before sightings of giant squid. Yeah, sure. They may have been taken from whalers who found like crazy scars yeah. on whales, who may have found like bits of tentacles, like huge tentacles Arms. in the whale's stomachs. Yeah. Things like that, and the been beak. like, where did this come from? Yeah, the beak. Yeah. Because um, they did find a giant squid once, but the sailors cut it up and used it for bait, but they preserved the beak, and that just fueled the legend even more and more. So <clears throat> that's, the, that's another interpretation of sea monsters is that they came from misunderstood or embellished sightings of actual sea organisms that we're familiar with now. Yeah. So it's the same thing. We just changed the name. Sure. Well, so, you're a sailor. You're drunk, maybe. Sure. You may be hallucinating because you've been out at sea for too long. Licking toads. You may be licking toads. You may be uh, physically ill, sleep deprived, fatigued. Right. Um, and you see a giant squid, you might write in your journal that I've seen the kraken. It makes perfect sense. Sure. You know? And it spreads and takes shape over time. You got a little the, scurvy going on? <laughs> <laughs> the Kraken's not the only one um, that's probably based on something real. The, like, sea serpents. So the Leviathan was a uh, sea serpent, many-headed sea serpent. It was a Mesopotamian god, like we said. Or no, I'm sorry, it was, uh, it was in the, the Old Testament. It may have been the Mesopotamian god. That's what I said. Yeah, but Leviathan always is sort of a catch-all word now for any, like, large, unknown, huge creature. Yeah, and apparently it's... In Hebrew, it just means whale. Yeah. Um, which, again... This is probably a whale. Well, yeah. Uh, it could have also been a sea serpent. So sea serpents are, the, are their own things. Um, the, uh, the Norse had a legend of the Jormungandr. Yeah. There's an Thor. umlaut in there and everything. Yeah. And that was apparently um, one of Thor's bigger headaches. Yeah, that was uh, the, the, the baby that was created when Loki 
his brother and a woman named uh, Anger Boda, uh, I guess, had um, the sex of the gods and created this creature. A, a sea serpent that wrapped around the globe. Supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's just one example of a, a sea serpent, a huge sea-bound snake. And there's a lot of suggestions of what accounted for sightings of sea serpents. Yeah. Huge things of floating kelp seen in the distance. Sure. Um, schools of porpoises. Yeah, all the all line together. There's one thing, though, that could have accounted for all sightings of sea serpents. It's called the oarfish. Did you see this thing? Yeah, it is huge. And um, if an oarfish was, was swimming in the water, it could be uh, undulating up and down, and it looks like little mm-hmm. spiny humps coming in and out of the water. Right. So that, that makes sense, sure. They get up to, I think, um, 30 or 40 feet? Yeah, they can. I mean, there's, there's plenty of photos of, you know, like 10 dudes on a beach holding one up. Right. Because it takes 10 dudes. Yeah. It's not like they all want their hand on the little fish. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? Yeah, they're, yeah. And these aren't photoshopped either. There's all kinds of stupid fake pictures too, but oarfishes are huge and they look like big slimy kind of serpentine fish. Yep. And then, Chuck, mer people were another kind of universal, um, I guess, sea monster myth. That's, a, that's another thing that stuck out to me. Yeah. Is there were... There are legends around the world from cultures that are separated by space and time that had similar stories Yeah. um, without possibly interacting. Yeah. So it makes you think that a lot of these people (laughs) cited similar things and came up with similar myths and legends to explain what they were seeing. Probably. Uh, The mermaid is, you know, if you've seen Splash, you think, wow, what a neat thing to find a mermaid. But mermaids were not... um, looked upon kindly because they would uh, and this article points out they would at the their best they would just forget that you can't breathe yeah. and drag you underwater till you die and at the worst they would do so on purpose right and take the men down under the water and lights out for you Tom Hanks yeah sorry Tom Hanks but sorry Darryl for Hanks. the rest of your career <laughs> Daryl yeah his career was pretty lousy after Splash wasn't it <laughs> well uh yeah what no um she, Daryl Hannah, though, in the movie, would uh, she was not a bad mermaid because she uh, kissed him and gave him breath. Right. Well, it's the Hollywoodification of the mermaid yeah. legend. Ron know? Howard. Or like Ariel from Little Mermaid. Oh, sure. And that dirty, dirty DVD cover. Oh, yeah. I, or I guess it was that. VHS cover. They probably corrected that before it went to DVD. Probably. Those Disney guys. Bored. Bored and, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I get bored and <laughs> blank. So um, the the whole mer creature had root in the Nordic areas and Scotland, which apparently there's parts of Scotland that are so far north that they consider themselves Nordic rather than Scottish. Oh, really? Yeah, Orkney, I think. Huh. And there's a whole part of Scotland that's underwater now called Dogland that was around ten or 12,000 years ago that's like this really fertile Neolithic artifact area it's pretty cool yeah dogger land that's what it is not dog land so um they had their own things called carpies chuck and what's interesting about the carpy is that the kelpie li- the kelpie yeah <laughs> i was thinking harpies yeah or carpies exactly but this is not carp or harpies they're kelpies yeah which are actually horses yeah. that live in the sea that can sometimes tra- cha- change into humans so they're oh. kind of mer creatures. Sure. But every every lake in Scotland has a kelpie supposedly associated with it. Yeah. Including Loch Ness. And it wasn't until the early 18th century that Nessie became like a sea creature right. that we think of her today when some dinosaur bones, plesiosaur bones were found around Loch Ness saying, well, this is what lo- the Loch Ness monster is. Right. Before we, that, it was just a kelpie. We could probably do a full show on Nessie I, just I for the fun should. of it. Totally should. Um, was has been pretty much disproven um, unequivocally, of course. Sure. Because there is no Loch Ness monster. Yeah. But I just think things like that are neat. I mean, we did one on Bigfoot. It's more about just the legend and the right. lore around it. Exactly. I'd love to do one on, on Loch Ness. Monster. Did you ever see the documentary that what's his name did Werner Herzog? No, I didn't know he did one of those. It was. Uh, I think it was a. Uh, he did a, a mockumentary, but not like a Christopher Guest mockumentary, just right. a faux documentary. <laughs> waiting for Nessie? Yeah, waiting for Nessie. Um, 
where it just looked like he was, uh, I can't remember the name of it, where he was searching for the Loch Ness Monster and saw, you know, caught it on camera, but it made it, he made it seem real. I think it was Werner Herzog. Huh. It was good, of course, you know. Sounds a little dishonest for Werner Herzog. Well, I don't, I don't think he was trying to pass it off, I think. I gotta see this. Yeah. I'll look that up. It may not be him, but someone did that, and it, and it was kind of cool, because if you buy into it, then you're like, oh my God, there it is. Are you sure this wasn't like uh, something on, on cable? Yeah, that was Herzog, actually. Noel says it was Herzog. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it probably played on cable at some point. Gotcha. Yeah. Noel talks a lot more than Jerry does. <laughs> Um, so, Chuck, there, that brings us to our third interpretation for where sea monster legends came from, people finding dinosaur bones. Yes, and uh, we'll talk more about that right after this break. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. All right, Dino Josh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it. Oh, well, uh, so I said that Nessie became this kind of sea monster yeah. around the time of Plesiosaur. I believe it's what it was. Um, skeleton was found around Loch Ness. They said, well, this, is, this must be one of Nessie's relatives. Apparently, that wasn't the first time that, that a dinosaur led to the idea of a sea serpent. You mentioned um, the Chinese having a legend of some sort of dragon, little tiny dragons that measured about three feet long. Um, or no, I'm sorry, about a foot long. The Guizhou dragons. Yeah. And they were basically marine reptiles called uh, Kichasaurus hui. They, they, but they were lucky. Like if you found one of these skeletons, you kept it because it was a little sea monster skeleton that you got your hands on and it would bring you good fortune. That's right. And uh, I know earlier we were talking about just the early explorers. And uh, you can't fault some of these dudes because they were, you know, as this one article you said, they were literally in uncharted waters. Yeah. And it was before the rise of science. And all they had heard were stories and folklore. And anytime you saw, if you ever see a map, a sea map, oceanic map from the 1500s, mm -hmm. it's going to have some sea monsters drawn on it, even as just decoration. So it was a time when uh, before there were, you know, before observational data came along, we pretty much, it was sort of like the internet today, you pretty much just rewrote uh, earlier history books over and over. Right. Until they finally got a little smarter and say, you know what, maybe we should really observe something and then write about it right. for real. And This didn't really lead to any, anything more substantiated, you know? Well, for a while, sure. But um, it was, uh, they call it a transitional era in this article, which I right. think kind of sums it up. The, yeah, these were early scientists, early naturalists who were trying to get a handle on what the heck they were looking at. Um, but they still perpetuated legends, like they might have a real creature. Like a whale. Right. And then a, a similarly a natural um, biological illustration of a mythical creature. Right. Like a, a sea bishop. Yeah. So the sea bishop was this thing that was supposedly caught and taken to the king of Poland because it was this fish-like creature that had like a meter and robes like a bishop. Yeah. And apparently it could also talk and refuse to eat. Yeah. And when it would make the sign of the cross and everything. And later on, somebody said, mm, it probably didn't talk and make the sign of the cross. <laughs> But if you look at a squid a certain way, sure, that hat, it looks that a lot looks, like, yeah, yeah, it's got the hat and, and some of its flappy skin <laughs> looks kind of <laughs> like the robes, you know? So maybe that's where the sea bishop came from. Yeah. Simultaneously to this, we're talking like the 16th century, there was a pretty much a widespread belief that whatever you found on land had uh, an, an analogy in the sea. Catfish, dogfish, seahorse. All that stuff. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, they were right. Like, yeah. there are catfish, there are dogfish, because we call them that. Yeah, sea monkeys. See, right? <laughs> uh, the the seahorse, too. Yeah. Um, but the, all that kind of, it was a rough time for science. It was still getting its footing. Well, yeah, because, uh, you know, like you said, things were mistaken. Like, uh, a, a whale and a walrus might be a monster when it's just a whale or a walrus. And there were all kinds of tales that... You know, when it's repeated over and over, you get the sense that it's just uh, one of those, like, 
urban legends back then. Right. I guess it wasn't urban back then, though. <laughs> what would it be? Just uh, a seafaring legend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, of uh, whales being mistaken for islands, and like a ship will land on the whale and build a, you know, and root down, basically get off the ship and build a fire. And then the whale, I guess, who's just chilling out at the surface, says, hey, there's a fire on my back, and I'm going to take your boat underwater and swallow you whole. Sorry. I'm a whale. So beware of the, you know, whatever they called that, whatever culture called that particular whale. Exactly. Now we just call it a whale. And again, it was and you probably can't land an em- on their backs. It was <laughs> an embellished story, but the they they it was based on a sighting of a whale before they called it whales and back when everybody lied about everything they saw. <laughs> uh, another culture that found dinosaur bones and created their own legends were the Lakota and Dakota Sioux. Yeah, sure. They came up with something called um the Unctahila? Unctahila? Yeah, I think that's about right. <laughs> sure. From from dinosaur bones found in, uh, around the Missouri River. Yeah, and that was a water creature. Yeah, well, they were very evil water serpents that would eat anything, including one another. Yeah. And so the Thunderbirds would come and do battle with them. Thunder beings. Yeah, but I looked it up. It was basically <laughs> Thunderbirds. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. What they knew is that it wasn't a Tatanka. That's a buffalo, right? Yeah. Yeah. They were pretty sure. You know, um, that's apparently where the legends of the the Cyclops came from. From uh, Native Americans? No, from um, finding like old uh, elephant bones, elephant skulls, the huge cavity in the middle. Oh, gotcha. They were like, well, clearly there was a race of giants that just had one eye. Huh. No, they were elephants. You know, we often joke like they were dumb back then. Of course they weren't. They were just trying to figure it out. It's like to make stuff up. Sure. They didn't have TV or anything back then. And like we said, a lot, of this, a lot of this stuff was uh, yeah, was um, legend to keep, you know, boaters from going in a maybe a particularly dangerous part of the sea. Right. Or to keep the children away from the water. Yeah. And uh, like the ghost story and or the nuclear, uh, what's it called? Oh, nuclear semiotics. Nuclear semiotics. Man, everybody, go look that stuff up. Actually, Roman Mars has a 99% invisible about that one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Nuclear semiotics. Pretty neat. And effective, I imagine. We'll find out in 10,000 years. I guess so. Um, what else you got? Anything else? I don't have anything else on sea serpents. Um, just take a look at the anglerfish video yeah. and tell me if you came upon that. And see, we also didn't point out that this was before deep, not even deep sea exploration. Like, this is before underwater exploration. Right. People were just riding around on the top of the ocean. Yeah. So we're fascinated with it, and we've gone to the depths that we can attain at this point, which is pretty deep. I wish I would look that up. I don't know how deep we can go. How deep James Cameron can go? Oh, he goes deep, buddy. <laughs> but um, think about back then, man, when they couldn't, like, you know how scary that would be? Right. When these strange creatures are like, you see a giant squid. You know, yeah, and you're just partially seeing yeah. it. If you can't see it underwater, this you is, have no idea what yeah, you're looking at. Yeah, this is before the, the diving bell even. like there was Or the butterfly. That's right. Yeah. You like that one? Yeah. <laughs> I finally saw that movie, by the way. Hardcore, man. That's good, though. Yeah, really good. Uh, if you want to know more about the diving bell and the butterfly or about sea monsters, you can type those words into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this uh, Opa, which is German for grandpa. Um, long- I thought it was Greek for, like, good times. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> really? Yeah. Opa. Well, I'm sure it, those are just three letters together. <laughs> <laughs> Might be something in Greek. But like my uh, brother-in-law, uh, Karsten, is German and his grandfather was... Opa? Or, I'm sorry, his father. Yeah, his grandfather was Opa, but his dad was native German. So mm. my nieces called him Opa, hmm. as does this lady's. Uh, I'm writing in specifically about your whaling podcast. Oh, how appropriate. Uh, with a family story that Lucy re- uh, relates, my great... Grandfather Opa left Germany when he was 14, pre-war to work as a sailor, came to the U.S. and was a member of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, One day he was part of a team that was clearing a harbor of some old sunken ships. To do so, they used the sophisticated method of throwing dynamite into the water to blast the wood apart and then gathered the debris. His team rowed out uh, in a 14-foot rowboat to gather up the wood shards and noticed the blast had killed the fish. 
Uh, they floated to the top, so the crew uh, brought them in to the boat as well. Waste not, want not. Sure. Uh, as they were going about their business, they came across a 16-foot hammerhead shark that had floated up. Clearly, it would be a great source of food, so despite their small boat, they pulled it aboard. I think you see where this is headed. No, I do. Uh, well, as it turns out, the blast was strong enough to kill small fish, but only stun larger animals. Uh, the shark slowly started to regain consciousness in the rowboat, and being confused and out of water was not pleased. Uh, it got to the point that it was thrashing about in the boat, threatened to destroy the boat, and likely uh, injure or kill the crew members. So in the midst of this chaos, they were able to flag down a sailor on a larger vessel who proceeded to shoot the thing to death while it was still in the boat. Um, all of the crew members were safe, and they still got to feast on Hammerhead Shark, but now had a much more exciting story. Uh, and you mentioned in the whaling podcast, old-timey whaling, mm-hmm. crew members were deployed in small boats to get the whale and were often injured and killed. I uh, thought you might find this interesting. And I was hoping that you could give a shout-out to my sister, Rachel, who turned me on to your podcast in 2009. She lives in France, and we don't get to see each other frequently, but whenever we do, uh, Josh and Chuck always come up. That's us. So that is uh, Wendy Bear. She is a registered dietitian. And Wendy and Rachel, uh, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. thanks for listening and for spreading the word and for being uh, sisters. <laughs> Way to go being sisters. Yeah. Thanks for writing in, Wendy. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, and Chuck, this is our last episode of 2014. Oh, man, the longest year. So we want to say Happy New Year, everybody. Yes. And I want to say Happy Birthday to my sweet and lovely wife, Yumi. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday. That's the Rights Free version? No, that's the Stevie Wonder version. Oh. That's a good one. So it's not Rights Free. Yeah. So Happy Birthday, Yumi. Happy New Year to all of you great people out there in podcast land. We'll see you next year. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.